Welcome everyone. Today we're going to be unboxing the CRTT 1500. That's the Deltec TwinTech 1500 automated calcium reactor. Super excited about this unit. It's uh, relatively new technology in the, in the US. It's been used for several years in Germany. And let's get right into it. So each box comes with a serial number that'll match the actual uh, unit when we get in. We can see here, um, these ship very well. Uh, we ship ground straight to your home or office. Get this one out. So this is the, uh, the unit here. Again, serial numbers on the box. We see it's a TwinTech 1500. This is the smallest. They make a 3000 and a 10,000. The 1500 treats up to 400 gallons and the 3,000 up to 800 gallons, and the 10,000 up to 1,500 gallons. We have some options. Those are conservative ratings. A lot of people run the 1,500 up to five, 600 gallons without any problem at all. As you notice, you'll take the reactor out. It, it has a separate base plate here as well. Space the two reactors. And make sure you watch out because there's some filler boxes and there's as well one box labeled in here that has the controller and pump. So this is the box that you'll need. So now that we have the reactor out of the box, we're gonna go through the basic setup and what, what's included. So we have our box here, which has the controller, our instructions, our water feed pump, which is a DC pump. The nice thing about the CRTT is you really don't need to buy anything else other than a CO2 tank, some CO2 hosing, and a dual stage regulator. The water feed is controlled by this pump. You have um, an effluent pump as well and a research pump, and the controller regulates your CO2 gas, so there's no need for a CO2 doser. It comes complete, the controller, with a solenoid. This is the um, smart controller. Everything pretty much runs through this box. This is the brain of the calcium reactor. We got a couple levers. These are used on the handles to help get it on and off, especially after you've been running it and it's quite tight. This is your fill cap and we'll go over that. You replace this to put in media when without having to take off the complete lid or when degassing initially to get the water completely flushed and all the air out. Here's the power supply for your smart controller. So the, the water feed will be in your sump. Um, I should point out this can be run in sump or outside a sump because all the, the tubing controls the effluent and feed. So you don't need to take up valuable sump space if you don't have it. Um, this one here is your effluent to the tank. Obviously from the water feed, this is going to attach to the top of the reactor um, after going through the flow valve. When hooking up your water feed, uh, the water feed pump would be in your sump. And this simply is the flow meter. This measures how much water is going into the unit. It tells you on the back which direction the water is coming in. So we will do the pump to this side of the flow meter. And the top of the reactor is where the water goes in. So we're gonna use this smaller tubing to connect to the other side of the flow meter. This is all set by your smart controller, how much water you wanna go in. This just simply clamps on there and you're done. This connection's already made to the smart controller. The next connection we have is the feed pump will connect to the bottom of the controller and the CO2 will connect to the, the CO2 tank. This CO2 solenoid should be within a foot of your CO2 tank and we'll go over that as we hook it up, but it's very important that that stays close to the tank and not necessarily near the reactor so that it can trigger properly under the right pressure. With the water feed pump, you have an inline filter. This is. Um, keeps particulates from getting into the reactor. This can be reverse flushed every couple months to clean it. And then you have an inline check valve here so no water when the power's out can go back into your sump and into your system. This sponge here uh, initially will be filled with some air so when you submerge it in water you want to make sure you wring it 
and get it saturated with water so when this comes on, it doesn't push air into the unit. Periodically, you'll need to wash this sponge and make sure that it's clean so that your flow rate doesn't go down. This filter here will also reduce flow if it's not back flushed. So between these two, this controls your, your water pump and your feed. So now we're gonna hook everything up to the controller. So what we have here is these are color coded. So your water feed pump is yellow and this simply will line up with this DIN fitting here in the controller. Just make sure you push it nice and snug so that it's seated all the way. And just tighten this down. So this is a waterproof connection or splash proof connection, I should say. So it's safe around the aquarium. Then you have your red one. This is gonna be for your recirc pump on the top of the unit. This pump runs 24 seven and keeps water circulating within the reactor. So this is going to be the cable here. It is red, so we know that it goes to the red connection. So there again, we'll push it in nice and snug, line up the holes and the little notch, get it all the way seated. There we go. So now our controller's connected. Other than we have the power supply, this one will go here on the far left. And what I have here is an optional night mode adapter. We offer these uh, on our website. So these allow the reactor to shut off at night. So if you're running the reactor very hard and you're getting a lot of effluent, that can lower the pH of your system. So some aquarists like the fact that they can cycle it off during, at night when the pH is the lowest and then compensate for it. This is a special adapter that goes into a timer that you set, manual timer, or it can go into a, an apex controlled plug it's a special 10 volt. And if you buy the night mode adapter, it goes here and that covers everything in the reactor. So that will stick out normally. So that's the night mode adapter. The last thing to plug into the controller is your CO2 float sensor. So this is your float sensor and this is the connection. It simply goes in this hole here. So a lot of people ask, what is the difference between the CRTT1500 and a regular calcium reactor. So it's quite a bit different in how it operates. A regular calcium reactor works by controlling pH in the reactor through a pH controller by using CO2 to lower the pH. This one uses no pH controller. It actually controls it by CO2 saturation. So those are your, that's your biggest difference between the Twintech and a regular calcium reactor. How it does this is it injects CO2 into the top of this chamber. As this CO2 builds up in here, it pushes the water down. When this triggers the float valve, by the water coming up, it adds more CO2. The recirc pump, meanwhile, is recirking down the gas chamber and is returning it to the media chamber. This is running 24 seven. The saturation of the CO2 is controlled by the pump speed. So by keeping the water saturated, the pH is fixed and therefore no pH control is needed. There is a pH probe port in the back for those that like to monitor the pH and want to see what's going on in the reactor. So Deltec did add that port for the curious Aquarius, but it is not needed. By adding the CO2 and keeping it saturated, the media will dissolve. As the media dissolves, you get inert gases and other things that build up. Therefore, the pH will slowly rise in the reactor, thereby triggering the water level to rise and the CO2 to come back in and keep it fully saturated. By adding tank water through the feed pump four times a day, the unit therefore controls how much water is going out. So when you the effluent is around 40 to 60 dKH. That is coming out of the top of the reactor here. By testing this, you know that you're getting fully saturated water. This reactor is also different from a traditional reactor in that it uses a very hard calcite media. And the reason for that is it's much harder and it dissolves more slowly at a lower pH. At CO2 full saturation, this reactor runs at 5.8 to 6.0 whereas your regular traditional reactor runs more in the 6.5 to 6.7. On average, you're running an average pH a little higher than 5.8 to 6.0 on the reactor because of the cycling. So you're really running around average about 6.2. This media works really well for that lower pH versus some of the um, calcium-based uh, softer coral rubble type media. But we've had people run different medias in it with no problems. 
We have seen uh, occasional uh, flow restrictions with the recirc pump if the media is not changed out more regularly due to softening of uh, coral skeleton media. This media seems to avoid that problem, so uh, we really do recommend either the Roalith or another calcite-based material. So now we've gone over the basic principle of how this differs from a traditional calcium reactor. We know that this is the media chamber. We will add the media, the calcite media, up into the Deltec logo, typically right here. And another unique thing with these reactors is they recommend that you keep the level there. You don't wait till it drops way down and replace it, drops way down and replace it with more traditional reactors. You want to keep it full all the time. And the reason for that is you get a more consistent effluent DKH and a more predictable impact on your aquarium so you don't have to keep changing the controller. You can change the media simply by opening this cap and then adding the fill, which we'll show you when we set it up. These are the bleed valves, which um, allow it to degas when you first set it up. And after that, these are always closed. When you, when you set it up too, you wanna make sure these unions are snug. There's O-rings there, so you wanna make sure those are tight. The pump O-rings are tight. Your sensor O-rings tight. All hand tight, of course. And now we're ready to really fire up the reactor and see how it works with water in it. We're now ready to set up the CRTT 1500 and there's a couple key things you need to watch out for when you're setting up. Otherwise, it's a very simple process. So first of all, we're going to um, access the media chamber and remove the flow meter here. To do that, you also need to disconnect the research pump with these unions, which are all hand tightened. So you can just carefully take these off. Turn that up, and now you can separate the cap. There's O-rings in here as well, so you wanna make sure that you don't lose those and they stay seated properly. So now we're ready to add media to the media chamber. So we're going to pull these two tabs up away from each other. And there we go. Lift this out carefully. And we'll inspect everything. Here's your O-ring for the cap. Very important that stays in place. And as you can see here, this is your water feed. This is your locking tab. This is where the pump is pulling from and then recirking um, into the degas chamber. That's your circulation. The plate's connected well, so this O-ring here, too, should be seated at the top of that coupling. And that's all ready to go. So, now we'll put the plate back in and start filling it with media. The 1500 takes five and a half kilograms or about 12 pounds of calcite material. So I have my calcite. I'm gonna start adding to the media chamber, being careful not to get any down the center tube. And there you have it. So, we were careful not to get any media down the center pipe. You can put tape or something over it. And now we're ready to close it up and start filling. We wanna get it as full as possible before we close it up and top it off. We're now ready to close up the reactor and do the final stage of degassing before we run it. So we're gonna just align the cap back on. We're gonna align the down tube, the short one, into the center tube, and making sure to get a snug fit. And then squeezing these handles gently together and getting a tight seal. There's that O-ring as well that needs to be seated and you'll feel it get nice and snug. Flow meter goes back on this handle. And for the last part of the degassing, we're gonna uncap this fill port. 
is a cap. Again, O-ring, make sure that the O-ring stays seated in the coupling. So we're now ready to use the extended fill port. This is for adding uh, media into the reactor as well as degassing it and getting the last bit of air out of it. Most people run into trouble at this stage because there's a small pocket of air trapped here and it doesn't get flooded out and vented out. So we're gonna do that now. We got this snug. We'll now reattach the pump, making sure that the O-rings are seated in each connection and that we get a nice hand tight turn on these unions. Now the research pump unions, just get a nice, nice, snug turn on it, making sure the O-ring's seated and we're ready. So now we're gonna fill the last bit of um, water in here and get water to fill these past these valves so that we're sure that we got all the air out of the unit. We do that by taking a small pitcher and just slowly pouring in this funnel. It's filling the pump housing now. This is evacuating all the air out of the system. As you're filling this up and topping this off and filling the gas chambers, you want to have the effluent tube as well at this height or above to prevent any water escaping. I'll just um, put this here for now and continue to fill. So you can see we're almost full in the gas chamber here. So once that floods, we'll start to get water up to the top of the reactor, which is where we want to do the final degassing. This is the critical part you need to be very patient with so that you top it off slowly and you get all the water. As you can see, water is beginning to come out of the siphon tubes and that's the last part of water that we need to get out. This funnel is filling as well, which means the reactor is completely full. At this point, we can take these tubes that I've attached and we can turn them down until water is solidly coming out. And now we're ready to close the valve it is flooded. We can do the same with this one. And we're ready to close the valve. You do not want to start the reactor with these valves open or you'll get air in the research pump. So at this point, we've got as much air out and as much water into the reactor as possible and we're ready to use the pump to do the last bit. Once we've bled the valves out, we're ready to remove the funnel. If it's not over a sump, you're gonna get the water that's in here spilling out. So be cautious of that if you're not over a reservoir to catch it. Otherwise, you can just use some towel or something to catch it. So we'll remove that. Now we're ready to put back on the cap to run the reactor, making sure the O-ring is seated well. This cap here, there's a textured side and a smooth side, and the textured side goes up. See there? And then back on. Again, hand tight here. The reactor's now degassed, so we're ready to start fire up the reactor and use the controller to push out the last bit of air and begin to start. Before we start, we check all our unions again, make sure everything's snug, and we want our CO2 gas off. I've hooked up this dual stage CO2 reactor it's very important that we use a dual stage reactor with this unit so we can control the outflow. One gauge tells you the pressure in the tank and the other one tells you the pressure leaving the tank. For the, the reactor, we want to feed it at well, around 0.5 to 1 bar, no higher. Otherwise the gas comes out too quick and pushes this level, this gas bubble down too quickly and will trigger a, a, an alarm for the controller. So 0.5 to one bar, and we leave the gas off until we're ready to, to really start the reactor, which is after we do our preliminary last bit of degassing with the controller. So we're now ready to plug in the controller and get the research pump going. So I have my power supply. 
and we're firing up the smart controller. This one's going to want to leak out, so we want to put this into a container. This would be your sump. This recommended that this goes below the water level in the sump. We've run them both ways, but Deltec recommends running it in water. Second point here, really critical, is that your solenoid, we've temporarily strapped it to the tank, is within 12 inches of the regulator. We don't want the solenoid near the reactor and the CO2 tank far away from the reactor because the solenoid won't have the pressure, proper pressure to switch open and close properly. So we want that CO2 to be flowing within 12 inches of the dual stage react, uh, regulator. So this pump's running, it's very silent. It's a DC pump. So we have water going through the reactor continuously. We're almost ready to start feeding some water here to the reactor, but I'll go through the different settings. So what we have here is a CO2 active. It's calling for CO2 because it wants to push out this water. And of course our CO2 is off. Before we do that, I'm gonna crank up the motor. Um, this is your degas. This is your pump speed. The pump speed's 20. We're gonna go up to 50 on the pump speed and you'll see the water recirculating within the reactor faster. So what we wanna do now is push out this last bit of air before we connect the CO2. It's very important at this stage that we do not have the CO2 sensor connected. So this is disconnected. This connection here is not connected while we do this. You get the light back up to the water flow 24. And once it's in that mode, you can press and hold the mode button for five seconds, and that will start the pump feed to feed water in and purge out any additional air. So we're gonna hold this for five seconds. The pump is now on. You can actually visibly see water go in here when the air bubble forms. This blue light is telling you that it, that's what it's doing and this will count to 100. We also have some air coming out of the reactor, which is good, which is what we're trying to do at this stage to just degas the reactor before firing it up. Sometimes this is necessary after a power outage or after you've added more media. So we'll let it do its thing and go to 100. And we'll do it one more time. Press and hold the mode button for five seconds while the, water, the light is on the water flow. It, the mode only works when the light is on the water flow 24 hours. So we're in active, we're gonna count to 100 again. Still pushing out some air, we may need to do it again. You can see now the water's flooded in this zone, which is good, which is higher than the pump return and suction. It's almost to 100. We'll do it one more time. So press and hold mode for five seconds. This is now pumping. The water's coming in here. If you look up under there, you can actually see it because there's usually an air pocket during this degas period. Make sure as well when the pump is running before you hook it up that you've squeezed out any air on the initial setup of this because that will be full of air. For the final degassing, we're gonna increase the pump speed to 100 by hitting the buttons. Pump speed light is on, pump 100, go up back to the water flow 24 hours, and we will press and hold the mode button and do the final bleed. And as it counts to 100, we're gonna open and close these valves and get the last bit of water out. This needs to be above these valves. So we want this open to get all the air out. It's flowing constant. And we'll now turn it off. And we'll do the same with this one. This white one needs to be up above it. And you can open the valve. It's bleeding out. You've gotten all the air out and turn the valve off before it goes back into recirc mode like that. So all the air is now out of the reactor. So we've degassed using the bleed valves, raising the effluent hose above these while using the active mode to push out the air. 
We're now ready to start the system. We'll power off one more time because we did not have the CO2 sensor on, on purpose. We're gonna plug it in, and as soon as the research pump fires up, we're gonna start the CO2 sensor. Now, this is ready. We're plugged in. It's gonna call for gas. The blue light will come on. Our valve is off. There's the blue light. Now we wanna slowly open the CO2 valve. Gas is going to come in and push the water out. And you're gonna see it come out here. There we go. It's dropping down to the float sensor. This would be your sump. This would be your sump. The level's gonna hit the sensor and shut off. As that gas forms, we're getting full saturation with CO2. There goes the sensor. Gas is off, green light, normal operation. The first several days will be a lot of gas off and on and regulating because you have a lot of gas trapped in these, this new media in between the substrate. So it's gonna resetting itself. We'll now go back on the pump speed to 50. 50 is a good speed to leave it on for the first day. And mode wise, we're gonna go leave it on 50 liters a day. And we want the degas to match the water flow. The water flows at 50. So let's increase the degas to 50. So now we're gonna let it do its thing. The water's gonna slowly rise and fall until it sets itself over the next several hours, and then we're in continuous operation. Okay, we're still regulating. The water level's coming up some, and the gas is pushing it down. It's forcing out um, all the inert gas and flushing it with CO2. That level of the water level dropping about that pace is what you want. Maybe about an inch every three to five seconds. If your bar pressure is too high, it will force that out of that tube too quickly and you'll get errors. So that's why we found 0.5 to one bar on the output setting is the best setting, which is here, we're a little low. Let's turn this up 0.5 while it's dosing. There you go. This is submerged in your sump and this is feeding. So this is the regular operation of the reactor and it should pretty much operate like this without any hiccups which is why people love this reactor is once it's set and degassed you really don't have to uh, worry about it any longer now in terms of calculating what flow rates appropriate for your tank you'll need to check the dkh daily and a good place to start uh, at 50 liters or even 30 liters um, is probably best because then your alkalinity is going to go up really slowly. You don't want to shock anything, but you want to be checking that. If the alkalinity continues to rise, then you drop it down five to 10 liters. If it continues to rise, drop it down five to 10 liters until it doesn't go up or really down, and that's your set flow rate. As a reminder, your water flow and hit mode again, your degas mode should always be the same. And what that means is it's only going to degas once per day. Unless you have a larger tank than this is rated for, larger than 400 gallons, or an extreme amount of corals that have a high calcium demand that you need to degas it more, which uses more CO2 um, and more media, uh, you really don't need to degas more than once a day. So the reactor is running steadily now. It's uh, the level sensor is appropriate. That's about where you want to be. This will slowly get pushed down. We have large bubbles in here now, and after a few days, you get basically more fine bubbles in the bottom. There's a pickup tube down here that will slowly start to pick up a little bit of that CO2 that will go back in the reactor and actually keep it super saturated. But the first few days, you're gonna get this kind of effect until you start to get um, the white small bubbles here at the bottom of this diffuser plate, which is ideal. 
Well, I hope you've enjoyed this CRTT video. I know that um, it can be an intimidating piece of equipment, uh, but actually once going, it's very, very simple. We have all the parts and technical help you need and are available seven days a week. You can find us at our website, Dell Tech Direct USA, or on Facebook or Instagram at Dell Tech USA.